as we're thinking about the Lord being wonderful, I'm praying that I can continue that theme through the message this morning. We'll be looking at Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 25. Matthew chapter 6, starting with verse 25. The Bible says, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. If I had to title this message this morning, I would title it, He Will Take Care of You. Amen. He Will Take Care of You. I'm going to give you six words this morning that we will touch on and it could kind of help you to know when I'm about to be done with my sermon if you pay attention to these six words. <laughs> Amen. The first word is the command. The second word is the comfort. The third word is the consideration. The fourth word is the comparison. The fifth word is the chase. And the sixth word is the conclusion. So if you pay attention to those six words, it'll kind of help you to know where I am when I'm about done. Amen. So you don't have y'all can put y'all watches up this morning. Don't look at the clock. Just pay attention to those six words. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. And we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. And we thank you, Lord, for taking care of us. And we're asking, Father God, that if there's any that may not be saved this morning, that they don't leave this place without putting their trust in the Lord Jesus. But for those of us who have put our trust in the Lord Jesus, there's times, Lord, that, that our faith is tested. And we're asking, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning and they're in that testing time, that they will be encouraged this morning, that you will take care of them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Three times we see the word therefore. In verse 25, we see the word therefore. In verse 31, we see the word therefore. In verse 34, we see the word therefore. Right after take. Now, right after therefore, we see the command. Right after therefore, we see the command. In verse 25, the Bible says, Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Take no thought. Now, in verse 34, it is rearranged just a little bit, but it has the same concept. We cannot just pay no attention to the repetition in this passage. Repetition is like a broken record. 
It cannot go ignored. Repetition in the scriptures always emphasizes the seriousness of the instructions. So when Jesus repeats himself three times, you and I need to pay close attention. Jesus said, take no thought for your life. He said, don't take thought, which means don't be anxious, but don't be overly concerned. Warren Worsby puts it this way. He said, don't be drawn in different directions. Thayer said, don't be troubled with care. Now, I want to say this. God doesn't condemn being concerned or planning for the future. But he doesn't want us to allow our hearts to be tr so concerned about the future that it's troubled or that it's upset or that it's disturbed, afraid, bothered, confused, fearful, irritated. I want you to know this morning that God is concerned about the troubled heart. <coughs> in John chapter 14 he told his disciples let not your heart be troubled God is concerned about a troubled heart when your heart is troubled you can easily be distracted and Jesus is about to teach his followers these disciples that they needed not to be distracted because there was a lot of work that needed to be done and with the work that needed to be done they didn't have time to be worrying because when you worried about things you can easily be distracted and Jesus was saying I don't need you to be distracted he said I don't want you to worry no more he said, I want you to stop worrying about life. Jesus said to them, do not be worried. Here Jesus is saying, I got your back. I got you. If you just trust me, I got you. Now, if we were in another denomination, we could run this morning with that. And say, you don't need to work. Because God got you, he said right here, don't worry about nothing. He's going to supply. But that would be stretching the scriptures because the Bible has a lot to say about a man working. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Because I don't need anyone to misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And look at verse 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10, the Bible says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he what? So, 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 so God is not saying, don't worry about anything, don't go to work not what he's saying. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5 and look at verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and look at verse 8. The Bible says, but if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, an unbeliever. Go to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. And look at verse 6. Proverbs chapter 6. And look at verse 6. The Bible says, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be what? 
which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provides her meat in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travails, and thy want as an armed man. The Bible teaches that it is okay for a man to work and plan for the future. But what Jesus is saying here in Matthew is that life is a little bit more important than worrying about what you are going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. Life is a little bit more than obtaining material possessions and, and obtaining things that only has value in this world. Someone said it is foolish to be preoccupied with money that you forget to pay attention to life itself. James puts it this way in James chapter 4 and verse 14. He says, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Christopher Morley said, life is a foreign language. All men mispronounce it. James M. Berry said, life is a long lesson in humility. And I would say that we all have a lot to learn. Look at what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12. In verse 13, given this parable of the rich fool, Luke chapter 12 and verse 13, the Bible says, And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And this is what Jesus said. He said, Take heed. And beware of covetousness, for a man's life consists not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do, I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. He says, Take thine ease and eat, drink, and be merry. But look at what God said. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? And then he says, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Go back to Matthew 6 and verse 25. Jesus says, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, or yet for your body, what ye shall put on, then he asks the question. He says, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Here Jesus is saying, you need to keep your focus on what I'm trying to teach you. Because life is a little more than what you think life is about. And Jesus says, I need you to pay attention to my words. See, you and I, we would do good today in 2015 to pay attention to the word of God. Because the word of God, what Jesus was saying to these disciples right now, is that God will take care of you. And he's saying the same thing to you and I today, that God will take care of us. Look at the example that Jesus uses in verse 26. He said, Behold, the fowls of the air, 
I looked up the word behold of the fowls of the air, and it means observe diligently. It means look at the birds. Take a good look. Pay attention to the birds. Keep watching the birds. Cast your eyes on the birds. Jesus said, God takes care of the birds. You can't see that? There are over one million species of animals. And Jesus decided to choose the birds. To use that as an illustration. I looked up how many species of birds there are, and there's over 10,000 species of birds. I said, Jesus, why did you pick the birds out of all of the species of animals to use as this illustration? You have to understand the wisdom of our God. Birds eat insects, bugs, seeds, fish, other animals. Bread, french fries, worms. I found this fascinating that God blessed the birds to be able to hear the worms underneath the ground moving so they'd be able to find worms. And I said, well, that don't help them in the wintertime. So I looked it up and said, what is, how do the birds eat in the winter? In the, in the wintertime, the birds eat dirt, and they find bird feeders put in the backyard by who? They find crumbs on the ground from man throwing down crumbs. Some birds store up bugs for the winter. But I found this interesting. A bird will eat pretty much anything that fits in his mouth. They're not picky like you and I. <laughs> They're not. I mean, Anthony is getting to the point now he got his little taste buds and he's, he, he don't eat certain things. He's saying, I don't want that. Me don't want that. Me don't want that. Where did you learn that? <laughs> you, you eat what we put in front of you. <laughs> but he's getting now, he's three now. He just turned three a couple weeks ago and he's getting to the point now he don't like certain things. Me don't like that. Birds don't say that. <laughs> A bird will eat just about anything. Now when I think about that, I think about the wisdom of our God for using a bird as an illustration of how God takes care of his creation. But here's the comfort in the story. Here's the comfort. In verse 26, he says, Behold the fowls of air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into the barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. But here's the comfort. What does he say after that? Oh, that should comfort your heart. It should have brought comfort to these disciples. Go back to Genesis 1 and verse 26. I know this might upset some people in here if you're an animal lover. But people are more important to God than animals. You might love your cat, you might love your dog and your fish, but I have to tell you this morning, Jesus didn't die on the cross for no fish. <laughs> Genesis 1 and verse 26, the Bible says, And God said, let us make man in what? And then after our likeness. And then he said he wanted man to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over who else? And over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. I have to tell you this morning, people are way more important to God than animals. Here in Genesis 1 and verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image. I looked up that word image, and it means representative figures. 
we represent God. We should be the spitting image of our Father. When somebody sees us, they should be able to see a picture or a portrait of, of what God looks like. A reflection of who God is. But you and I know that sin has messed up that image. Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 29. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Look at verse 29. The Bible says, Lo, this only have I found, that God has made man what? Man was made upright. But man has decided to seek out many inventions or schemes. When people see us, they should see a resemblance of God. It's like a Xerox copy or a carbon copy. We, they should be able to, when, when people see Christians... That is why they use the word in the world, you are a what? Hypocrite. Because when they see us, they expect us to behave and act like who? When we're not acting in that manner, they use a word for us. See, our God is holy. And he commands us as men and women of God to be holy as well. Nowhere in scripture do you see God being concerned about the holiness of animals. Go to Romans chapter 5. And look at verse 6. Romans chapter 5 and look at verse 6. The Bible says, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for who? Nowhere in scripture does it say that Christ died for the ungodly and for animals. We are more important to God and more valuable to God than animals. Verse 7, he says, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. Now like verse 8, he says, But God commended his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That word commendeth means to introduce, announce, or make known. He made known his love toward us. He didn't do this for animals. God has provided a way for you and I to be able to spend eternity with him. He didn't do that for animals. God loves man so much that he sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for man's sin. If God is concerned about man's spiritual needs, you better believe he is concerned about man's physical needs. And I love what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 because it comforts my heart. He told the disciples, he said, in 26, he said, yet your heavenly father feedeth them. It is God that feeds the birds. He says, are ye not much better than they? What he's saying is that if God feeds the birds, God will make sure that he feeds you as well. In Matthew 6 and verse 27, Jesus gives another reason not to worry. He says, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Cubit is a measurement of 18 inches. Stature is the Greek word helikian. It means full age or maturity. Kind of put it in the perspective of a span of years or a span of one's life. What Jesus said is no one could add 18 inches to their height by worrying about it. So if you short this morning, <laughs> Savannah, don't worry about it. Because worrying about it is not going to add any inches 
to your height. Taking thought means worrying, and worrying means to torment oneself, to suffer from disturbing thoughts. Worrying cannot add time to a man's life. Worrying cannot add one hour, no matter how much one worry. Worrying doesn't help our situation, but putting our trust in God may open up doors for our prayers to be answered. Go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4 and look at verse 6. Paul says, be careful for nothing. That word careful means anxious. Don't be worrying about nothing. But in everything, by what? With thanksgiving, let your what? Then verse 7, he says, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. What you and I need to do, we need to ask God to help us to learn to trust him more and to pray more. Uh, about three weeks ago, my wife was sick. Well, four weeks. My wife was sick, and all three of the kids were sick. And I have to be honest with you, my wife is a stay-at-home mom. Uh, I'm the sole provider for our home. And I said, uh, Lord, my wife is sick. I can see it in her face, and the three kids are sick. It's not right for me to go to work. And I don't like calling in to work. I like to be faithful. Uh, I started to talk to God about it, and I said, Lord, I'm going to go ahead and be a good husband. I'm going to stay home and take care of the kids. So I made a decision to call in to work. But I have to be honest with you, in the back of my head, I was thinking, the first day that we call in to work, we don't get paid for it. We get paid for the next two. Now, I could have got paid for it, but I was saving those hours for another day. And I said, Lord, my check's going to be short, $100. I said, I'm not going to worry about it, Lord. And you know I need that $100. <laughs> but I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to do the right thing and stay home with my wife and my kids. I made that decision, Sister Cation, and I came home uh, on lunch. I think it was two days before I got paid. And I was talking to God. I said, Lord, you know this Thursday I get paid. Just being honest, that's how I talked to him. I said, my check going to be short, $100. I said, but Lord, I'm not going to worry. Right now I'm worrying, but I'm trying to convince myself that I'm not worried. <laughs> that's, that's what prayer does for you. That's what it does for you. So I'm, I'm having this dialogue with God, and I said, Lord, I'm not going to worry. I go to the mailbox, not expecting nothing, because nobody ever sends you anything in the mail. You understand? It would be nice if they did, but they don't. So I went to the mail to get the bills as usual, and I got a letter from somebody from the church in Michigan that we used to pastor. Having two and a half years, they haven't blessed us with anything. I saw the card. I thought, oh, they're just thinking about us. Praise God. Not being honest, not expecting anything, not thinking nothing, just thought they were saying hello. I opened the card, and it was a $100 bill in there. I got in the house, and my wife was looking at me, and I said, I said, baby, God, you're so good. He is. I said, he don't, and before I went in the house, I had a moment. I just stood out there and looked in the sky, and I said, God, you just constantly take care of me. I can't speak for what he does for nobody else. I can't. I can't. My story might be a little different from yours, but I have to share mine for him to get his glory. And I said, Lord, I mean, who sends somebody $100 in the mail at this time? And I called that member and I told him, I said, you know what, thank you for walking with God and listening to him at this time because I needed that $100. <laughs> and Go 
back to Matthew chapter 6. And look at verse 28. Jesus says, And why take ye thought for raiment? And I like this. He said, Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. There's that third word, so you'll pretty much know where I am in my sermon, amen? The consideration. The word consider is only used ten times in the New Testament. Four times in the Gospel. One time in the book of Matthew, which is here. Two times in the book of Luke, and one time in the book of John. Be that as it may, this particular word in the Greek is only used here in Matthew 6, verse 28. So the author is really trying to get our attention here. We need to pay attention to this word consider used in this text. The word consider here is the Greek word katamakwite. It means to learn thoroughly, to note carefully, observe with attention. So what he's saying is study how the lilies grow. He said, see how the flowers grow. Look and learn how the flowers grow. He said, the lilies don't work, yet they grow. I'm here to tell you this morning, it is God who takes care of the flowers. I like the comparison that Jesus uses in verse 29. The comparison. He says, and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if you know your Bible, and you know anything about King Solomon, you know that Solomon was the man. Solomon is known as the king of splendor. The Bible says there never was and never will be anyone that can compare to King Solomon. And here Jesus says in all of Solomon's splendor and all of his royale, he did not array like one of these. If you ever watch a ceremony when like the Prince of England comes into the room, I mean that thing is magnificent. And when they come into the room, you can't help but look and stare at the beauty that is before you. Solomon was like that. When Solomon came into the room, all eyes was on him. All eyes was on Solomon. Here Jesus says that Solomon didn't look as good as these flowers. And I have to be honest with you, last Sunday I might have ignored it, but I don't know if these are new flowers or not. But I just, I just sat there for a second and I, because I knew what I was preaching on this week. And I looked at the flowers and I said, man, those things are beautiful. And if you like Sister Greenfield, you like flowers, man, you can go to some places and you see flowers and you just look and be amazed. They're just pretty. You go to a married couple house and they got a, 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 a vase with some roses in it. Don't they just look pretty? Seems like everybody say something about it. Them some pretty flowers. Just capture the room. And here Jesus uses this illustration. He says flowers and grass they depend on God, and God never fails. Man depends on money, and money fails at times. Now, we as a church, we have a decision to make who or what we will put our trust in. Here, Jesus is trying to teach his disciples. He's saying, hey, I need y'all to pay attention to this because I'm about to leave y'all soon. And I need y'all to understand I got work for you to do, and I don't want you to get distracted. In verse 30, he says, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? And then he says something. He attaches something onto that. What did he attach onto that? The word much here in verse 30 means abundant, 
plenteous, great in quantity, quantity, generous. God will give you a substantial amount. Here Jesus was telling his disciples, y'all need to grow in faith. And if we're honest this morning, we do as well sometimes. But thank God that growth is possible. Last Christmas, you know, there's only a certain time of the year that I can get overtime on my job. Last Christmas, I told my wife in November, I said, uh, I said, baby, what I'm going to do, I'm going to let you know, I'm going to be getting home from work a little late because I'm going to try to stay over and get some overtime. And my wife said, why are you going to do that? I said, because I want to be able to get you and the kids some things for Christmas and still be able to send some gifts to our family. She said, you don't need to do that. Don't worry about us. I said, no, nah, I'm going to do this. With my mind, because I'm a man. I'm going to do this. <laughs> so the first day, Brother AJ, that I decided to stay over and get some overtime, on my last break, I called my wife and I said, uh, how you doing? She said, I'm doing good. She said, you still staying over? I said, yep, that's the plan. You know, I, I, I have to say this. I have to say this. I say this. I don't really like my job, so she knows, she knows I really wanted to come home, but I was going to stay. And she said, you sure you're going to stay? I said, yeah, I'm going to stay over. She said, why don't you just come home? And Brother Williams, when she said that, it melted my heart. <laughs> and I got off the phone, and I told God, I said, God, my baby want me to come home. And I'm not, I'm not like the average man. I'm not trying to get away from home. I'm trying to go home. Do you understand? I love being at home. I do. I need to say that because we got some married couples in here. I love going home. But I told God, I said, God, you know what I want to do. If my baby want me to come home, I'm going to go home. And Sister Case, and that pattern kept going all the way up to Christmas. She said, you're going to stay over? I was like, no. I'm coming home. Long story short, I didn't work no overtime. <laughs> I didn't work no overtime. But let me, let me tell y'all what happened. Right before Christmas, somebody gave us some clothes for our kids. Somebody gave us $200. Somebody sent us $200. Somebody gave us $50. Somebody gave us $100. Somebody gave us $50. Now, let me tell you something. When you add that up, I'm going to be honest with you, that was exactly the amount that I had in my head that I was staying over overtime to get. It was. I was amazed because I told my wife, I said, that is exactly the amount that I had in my mind that I was going to stay over to work towards to get. But then let me share something else with you. Somebody's spent over $150 on us and the kids. And then somebody blessed us with toys and clothes totaling over $500. You said, are you bragging this morning? I said, you know what I have to share what God is doing in my life. I'm only going to be on this earth for a short period of time. It really don't matter to me what people think about me. I didn't have to work no overtime. God took care of me and my family abundantly, much more than I could ever think that he would do. My question to you this morning is, how is your faith? You'll never be able to convince Sean Moore that God won't take care of you. Sixteen years ago, God came and got me out of the streets. He said, I got work for you to do. I said, Lord, somebody like me, with what I'm doing right now, with my life, he said, yeah, I got work for you to do. I decided to stop selling drugs. I just decided to stop doing any illegal activity. And here it is, 16 years later, I can honestly say 
say, God has taken care of me. But I have to say this. I made a decision 16 years ago to start, start, to start tithing. We haven't missed tithing not one time. There have been some times I thought about it, Sister Kate. <laughs> and I can honestly say, God knows I'm not lying, it's only been about twice that I said it would be nice to keep this instead of putting it in that offering plate. <laughs> but for the most part, I'm a cheerful giver. God's been rewarding that faith. Hmm. Verse 31, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall you eat, or what shall you drink, or wherewithal shall you be clothed? <laughs> he said, For all these things, in verse 32, do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. There's two reasons that Jesus wants his disciples not to worry that we see in this passage. The number one reason is he wanted his followers to be different. Look at what he said in verse 32. For after all these things do to what? He said, I don't want y'all to be like them. I want you to be different. Please be different. He's saying the same thing to the church today. I don't want you to be like the world. Don't seek the things that they're seeking. And don't you misunderstand what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. But don't just live for that. Man, if God bless you with a nice car, drive that thing till the wheels fall off. And let me ride sometimes. Amen. God bless you with an abundance of money. Enjoy that. And recognize that you can't take none of that with you. Jesus said, I don't want you to be like them. That's the first reason. But there's a second reason. He says in verse 32, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, then look at what he says. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. That's the second reason. He's saying, I want, to, I want he, this is what Jesus said. He said, I want y'all to know that my father is omniscient. And he knows everything that you need before you even ask. And he's going to take care of you. He wanted his followers to trust his God. Trust his, fa his father, which is our father, our God. It's the same message to the church today. God wants us to trust him. Put our trust in him, not, not in, in what this world. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a little nervous. They talking about we can't retire now until we're 70. I ain't feeling that. <laughs> I ain't feeling that. And they're talking about money might not be there. I'm not feeling that either. Been putting money in for a while now. What do you mean it might not be there? Somebody going to have my money, Sister Johnson, when I get ready to retire. Somebody going to have it. Got in the flesh there, Lord. Leave me. Help me. Look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8. Jesus said, Be not ye therefore like unto who? There it is again. He's putting that emphasis. He wanted them to be what? Different. And then look at what he says. For your father what? You got to understand that. But see, when the devil gets you to thinking that God doesn't know what you're going through, that's not true. It's a lie. And that's why it's so important for us to meditate on God's word. When that doubt starts to creep in, you can hold on to God's word. In verse 33 of Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, but seek ye first the what? The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Now we come to the chase. The verb seek here means to seek continually, to obtain. I like this, Brother James Williams. 
it means, it carries the idea of a hunter who catches his prey and enjoys it. I'm not a hunter, but James is, and Pastor Scott is, and they just love to come back and brag about the deer that they done got and the fish that they catch. They enjoy that. That is the same desire and thrill that we should have when we're seeking God's righteousness. We are to go after God's standards. We are to chase the kingdom life. We are to follow after God's righteousness. Just like a hunter goes out into the woods early in the morning and seeking his prey, and they wait patiently. Brother Williams asked me, he said, you going to come hunting with me one day? I said, how long are you out there? He said, all day. I'm not coming out. I said, I'm not coming with you. <laughs> that brother dedicated. He said he sit out there all day. Not me. <laughs> if a deer don't come within the first hour or two, I'm ready to go. <laughs> and that is the, that's the attitude that we have with God's word. And it's not a good attitude to have because if you're going to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, it's continually. You're going to have to have some patience with this. You're going to have to dig and wait because being like God is not going to come overnight. It's going to take some time. This isn't a microwave situation. And that's what's wrong with a lot of us in church today. We, we think it's just instant. And we give up. And what I mean by give up is that we have stopped the Holy Spirit from doing work. And I, I can say that because I'm around a lot of Christians who are not even listening to the Holy Spirit when he speaks to them anymore. Because they have come to the conclusion that I can't, I, I'm never going to get to where Jesus is, so I might as well be comfortable where I am. But that's not what God has designed for us. His design is that we keep seeking. Is that we don't give up. That we keep trying. You know how many times I failed trying to be like God? And do you know how many people pointed out to me on a day-to-day -day basis? Just yesterday on the job, I told my boss, I said, you know what, he's a Christian. I said, I love how you see what I do wrong. I did. I told him. I said, I, t I talked to God. I told him the truth. I told God just a minute ago, I love how you always see what I do wrong. And he said, you are in the microscope. I said, well, you are too. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not shying away from that because the simple fact, I know, what I, I know who I am. I know what I'm called to do. I know who I'm supposed to point people to. I'm trying. I'm not going to stop. And it's amazing how many people want to point out Sean Moore mistakes and don't want to look in the mirror. But I, 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 I have to say that I got eyes too. But the difference is, the difference is, I got to keep my eyes on the prize for me. So I can't get distracted looking at what y'all are not doing. Amen. See, I, I'm, I'm in this chase, thirsting for this righteousness. It only comes by faith in the God man, Jesus Christ. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and look at verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and look at verse 3. He says, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud. Knowing nothing but dotting about questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railing, evil, surmising, perverse, disputing of men, and corrupt mind, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content, but they that be, will be rich fall into temptations and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in the destructions and prediction 
For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But look at what he says in verse 11. But thou, O man and woman of God, flee these things. So I want you to follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. See, that's what we ought to be chasing, not the American dream. I still have to make it clear, there's absolutely nothing wrong with having money. Get all that you can get, as long as it's not hindering you from doing what God has called you to do. The moment God tells you you have enough, you got to learn to be content. When God said, I don't want you working because I want you to do something, you need to be able to say, Lord, I'm not going to work. I'm going to do what it is that you have for me to do. Whenever you get to the point that you can't do that and make that decision, then money is your God. And this is what Jesus is trying to warn his followers of. Now, we make it very clear that Jesus is not teaching that if we seek his kingdom first, and how he says all these things will be added unto you, some people take that and make it seem like, well, if you seek God's kingdom, you'll never have any cares. You'll never have any worries. All your money will just be falling out of the sky for you. And I have to say that's not necessarily true. Because I still have cares. I still have troubles. I still have struggle. But what he is saying in this verse is that when you seek God's kingdom first, when those cares and those worries and those troubles come upon you and you start to get cumbered and you start to sweat, remember this. You keep seeking what God's telling you to seek, and then God will come through for you while you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. It's not saying that you would never go through some hard times. You might be going through some hard times right now. But if you keep your focus on reading the Word of God, meditating on the Word of God, studying the Word of God, you stay in church, stay faithful in what God has called you to do, then God will step in because of your faith and do what only He can do. The conclusion of this message we can see in Matthew 6 and verse 34. Jesus says, Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow should take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Worrying about tomorrow will only keep your heart and your mind in bondage. We need to keep our minds clear from distractions so that we can stay faithful in doing what God has called us to do. My assignment, your assignment is the same assignment that God gave the disciples over 2,000 years ago. Do you remember the Great Commission? Because this is all the teachings that Jesus was giving these men were leading up to this assignment. Look at Matthew 28. All of the teaching was leading up to what he wanted them to do. In Matthew 28 and verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. And then he tells them what he wants them to do. He says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have what? Remember, First commandment was take no thought. Don't be worried. And look at what he says. Attach this onto this verse. He says, and lo, I am with you what? Even when. I want you to remember the command. Remember the comfort. Remember the consideration. Remember the comparison. Remember the chase. Remember the conclusion. Worrying will never change your situation. But be that as it may, prayer can change your situation. So I want to encourage you this morning, put your trust in God, put your trust in God's word, God will take care of you. I'm praying that 
we have some saints in here that have this testimony like what David had in Psalm 37 and verse 25. David said, I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. If that's your testimony this morning, you need to do like the psalmist said in Psalm 77 and verse 12. The psalmist said in 77 verse 12, I will meditate also of all that work. And then he said something else. Anybody know? He said, I'll talk of thy doings. We can't, it's not enough for us just to acknowledge what God has done for us and keep that to ourselves. So I would like to encourage you to share what it is that God has done in your life, how he's taken care of you. If you find yourself right now questioning God, I want to encourage you to trust him. He will take care of you. He will take care of you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. And we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We're asking, Father God, that you help us to trust you more. Help us to realize, Lord, even for those of us who, who, who may be getting older and we can't work, praying, Father God, that even those will, will put their trust in you and know that you have their best interests at hand. Lord, for those of us who are still in the workplace, help us to realize, Lord, that our job is not the source of our income, but you are. You can bless us, Father God, in spite of where we work. Help us, Lord, to be faithful in tithing and giving to your work. We're asking, Father God, if there's anyone here and they're not 100% sure that if they die right now that they will spend eternity with you, that they will not leave this place without accepting Jesus as their Savior. For those of us who have already accepted Christ, we're asking, Lord, that you give us boldness to open our mouth, to share the gospel, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ with those that we are around on a day-to-day -day basis. We thank you this morning for the opportunity to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.